everybody. Welcome to Washington Square Library. We're very happy to have author Nan Johnson with us here tonight. Nan graduated from Central Michigan University and he lives now in the area with his family. And his first historical mystery was set in the Detroit area right around 1910. And it's received excellent national reviews. And I just wanted to read you part of one of these. This is from Library Journal. It says, full of nonstop action, spot shifts and turns, and great insight into the early history of the United States car industry. This debut is part coming of age tale and part historical mystery. Essential for historical fans. Both of Dan's uh, books will be available for sale tonight. His second book has just been published. So let's please welcome author Dan Johnson. Thank you. I, thanks very much. I appreciate y'all coming out. I will, uh, I'll try to be as entertaining as possible. Uh, but Sherry, sorry, no tap dancing. That's out. Um, uh, what I thought I would do is uh, just read briefly uh, from the opening scene in Motor City Shakedown. And uh, then I've got a PowerPoint uh, and I'll go through uh, some information about Detroit Electric, the company. Uh, and a little bit about the electric car industry back uh, after the turn of the century. Uh, and then uh, talk about this uh, first mob war in Detroit history. Uh, and uh, if you have questions, feel free to stop me at any time, other than when I'm reading because I won't look. <laughs> I should. You know, it, it's funny though how soon you forget. You get on to the next book and so I what I've been been doing is you know I've done all this research on Eloise Hospital which was the big insane asylum in Wayne County uh, and a lot of the third book is set there so, uh, so I'll look at the first two books now sometimes and I'll see a passage and just go did I write that ah, doesn't even seem familiar sometimes but the beginning I think I I think I have pretty well <clears throat> okay so this is uh, set in 1911. My left index finger traced the shape of the little morphine bottle through the outside of my trouser pocket. Nearly two hours had passed since my last dose. Even though the pain in my right hand was tolerable and my mind was still enveloped in the delicious fuzziness of the opiate, I'd been fighting with myself for the last 15 minutes. One more taste before Moretti showed? I might not get another chance for a while. But I couldn't take too much. I had to be sharp. Movement on the sidewalk down the block caught my attention, and my hand went to the 32 tucked into my belt. I pressed farther back into the shadows of the alley, squinting at the couple who had just turned the corner. The few street lamps that worked were dim and widely spaced, doing little to add to the meager glow spilling from the windows of the crumbling red brick buildings. They strolled underneath the cone of light from a street lamp, both were men, one of average height, the other six inches shorter, perhaps a little over five feet tall, about Moretti's height. I studied them. Both wore white shirts, dark trousers with suspenders, and black derbies. But no, Moretti was stocky, built like a fire plug. The smaller man was wiry and moved more gracefully than Vito Adamo's muscular driver. I relaxed as they walked into Moretti's building. I couldn't get worked up over every man that passed by. This was a busy area, a rundown, though typical slice of Detroit's Little Italy. I was plenty familiar with the scenery there after investigating Vito Adamo's black hand gang for the last few months. Even though Adamo hadn't been directly responsible for the death of my friend, Wesley McRae, he had helped. That was enough. I pulled up my watch and angled it toward a street lamp, 1230. Moretti should be here. Every night I'd watched, he'd gotten home between 12.15 and 12.30, always with a different woman. Prostitutes, I assumed. The women left within 30 minutes, and Moretti exited the building at 1.45 sharp to go back to Adamo's saloon, The Bucket. This was the third straight night I had planned to jump him. On both previous occasions, I'd chickened out. But not tonight. Tonight, Carlo Moretti and I would talk. I pulled off my derby and the handkerchief I'd tied around my head and I wiped the sweat from my face. Past midnight and still somewhere near 90 degrees. 
For the tenth time tonight, I slipped the handkerchief back over my head and spun it around to cover my face below my eyes to be sure it would stay in place. If Moretti recognized me, I'd have to kill him. I didn't want to do that. After shifting the mask around to the back again, I returned my derby to my head and settled in to wait. I needed a cigarette but restrained myself. It would give away my position. Another couple turned the corner and ambled up the street. It was him. Carlo Moretti sauntered down the sidewalk with a slender woman on his arm. He wore a dark suit and a straw boater. She a green satin evening dress with a matching wide-brimmed hat. Moretti stood half a head shorter than she, but I wouldn't let his diminutive stature fool me. He was one of Vito Adamo's most accomplished killers. They entered his building and I glanced at my watch, 1240. She'd be here until 110. I wanted to burst in the room while they were in flagrante delicto, while Moretti's hands were occupied, but I didn't want any witnesses. I'd been waiting a long time. A few more minutes wouldn't matter. My right hand throbbed and I brought it up near my face. In the darkness of the alley, my black glove was nearly invisible, but I could see the silhouettes of my fingers contracted over my palm. I tried straightening them. They moved perhaps an inch and a searing wave burned its way up my arm. I grimaced and pulled the little bottle of morphine from my pocket. A taste, just a taste, would be enough to keep me from thinking too much about the pain. Trapping the bottle against my chest with my right arm, I twisted off the cap with my left, raised the bottle to my mouth and tipped it back for a second, just long enough to taste the bitter brown fluid. The numbing warmth began to trickle down my throat. This was the time to which I so looked forward. I took a deep breath and another, and then leaned against the wall to enjoy the peace that was beginning to cradle my mind. The front door of the building opened and the prostitute burst out, hat in hand. She hurried away, shoes clacking against the sidewalk, her stride somewhere between a walk and a run. When she passed under the street lamp, she glanced behind her as if to see if someone followed. I saw hints of red in her dark hair. Odd. She'd been inside for perhaps ten minutes, but Moretti was a son of a bitch. Who knew what he did to these women? I pulled the Colt pistol from my belt and checked the load. Seven bullets I hoped I wouldn't need tonight. I cocked it, flicked on the safety, and stuffed it back into my belt. At 1.30 I crossed the street and entered the dark stairwell. The mews of kittens came from a crate in the corner. Trickles of light filtered in from the hallway, illuminating the steps to vague dark shapes. The stair rail was sticky, the air wet, smelling of mold and sewage. Muffled voices rose and fell as I crept up to the second floor landing. I leaned out over the rail and looked above me. No one stood guard. Moretti didn't raid his boss's protection. Something touched my ankle. I jerked the gun from my belt before I saw it was only a cat. Breathing a sigh of relief, I shooted away and continued up the stairs. When I reached the top, I peered out at the hallway, lit to dusk by sputtering gas lamps. A dozen doors stood at 15-foot intervals, all but the third one on the right blanketed with Italian graffiti, as were the walls between. I kept my eye on the clean door. In roughly ten minutes that door would open, and a well-armed Moretti would head for the stairs on his way back to the bucket. But tonight he wasn't going to make it to the bucket. And I'm going to stop there. <laughs> of course, it creates a significant problem and will goes from there. So um, I wanted to, to uh, just kind of talk a little bit about Will Anderson, you know, sort of where he came from and um, how he ended up being the protagonist uh, in my books because I really, uh, you know, never saw writing a protagonist like him. Uh, and a lot of people have wondered why I did it. The identity, uh, first of all, the guy who owned Detroit Electric, uh, which I'll talk about in the company, was named William C. Anderson, and uh, he had a couple of daughters. Uh, he was married, had no sons, and uh, so I thought I could give him a son, make him a namesake, uh, and uh, put the pressures on him that uh, I think the son of a man like that would have. Mr. Anderson. Was a very 
you know, blue collar kind of guy. He was not, um, you know, even though he did end up belonging to um, the Detroit Athletic Club and, you know, a number of the country clubs and that sort of thing, uh, it was strictly a business thing for him. He was very much a, a blue collar, down to earth kind of man. But he was a very hard worker, very success oriented. And uh, so I was really trying to envision what it would be like to be his son and not really be in tune with the, the way that he thinks, not really having the same kind of disposition. Um, and uh, as, as I started uh, writing the first book, um, for, for some reason, uh, the whole idea of guilt and redemption was really strong in my mind. And, uh, I wanted to write a, a book of redemption, and that's really where uh, the Detroit Electric Scheme came from. And for those of you who've read it, um, at the beginning, Will is not the most sympathetic protagonist. Uh, I've had a few people say worse things. Uh, but um, I think it's for a good reason. You have to get there to appreciate why he is who he is. And, um, you know, I think for a first book, it, it was probably more of a risk than I acknowledged, that I really understood. Um, because, you know, you've got to have an agent like the book and think that there's potential. You have to have then the editor uh, be able then, they like it, they can sell it to their company. And, um, you know, I think in some ways it's, it's uh, good to play against type. You know, it's not the, I don't know if anybody reads Lee Child, but the Jack Reacher, you know, the great big tough guy, uh, you know, sort of John Wayne kind of a character. Um, whereas Will is, is very far from that. Uh, but I, I thought it would be interesting to take a guy who had lots of problems, mostly self-created, uh, and then put him in to a situation um, that is virtually impossible to get out of and then see if I could figure out a way to work him out of it. So <laughs> that's, that's where Will came from. Uh, so I, I want to talk then about Detroit Electric a little bit. Um, you can see this is the factory. This is from a 1911 uh, sales brochure. And this is a carriage factory. So um, Anderson Carriage Company was a very large manufacturer of carriages and wagons. Uh, they were founded in Port Huron in the mid-1880s and moved to Detroit in 1895 to expand the market. Um, business was extremely regional at that time, especially uh, in large products because it was so costly and difficult to move them any long distances. Uh, so businesses tended to sell in their immediate area, and that's why he decided to move to Detroit to try to expand the market for the business. Um, and so at, at this time, this is the car factory, and eventually the car factory took over the carriage factory as well. But even during this time period, you know, 1910, when the first book takes place, the carriage business was... Uh, much larger than the car business. And uh, as the carriage business continued to decline, uh, they had anticipation that their car business would grow, you know, at a similar rate, um, which it did for a very brief period of time. And uh, then they sort of hit a very flat line and uh, didn't have the kind of growth that they needed to be able to maintain the company. They still were able to stay in business, and actually the, the company was around until 1939, uh, which most people are not aware of. So um, this is out of a 1910 uh, sales uh, manual, and I, and I think it's, it's really telling about a couple of things. Number one, this is a 1908 uh, Detroit Electric, um, or 1909, sorry. And during this time period, uh, really pre about 1910, virtually all the cars were open-bodied roadsters or runabouts uh, like this. There wasn't a great deal in the way of closed cars. They just didn't think about it that way. Uh, they were really wagons that didn't need horses. 
And um, with the Detroit Electrics, uh, they were carriages that didn't need horses. Uh, so this is really where they started to come up with the styling. They and Baker Electric, which was out of Cleveland and was their main competitor. If you look at Jay Leno's website, um, he's, he's a Baker guy. He has an 09 Baker. Uh, when I had the fortune to be able to go and, and talk to him, um, we had a discussion about what was better, the Detroit Electrics <laughs> or the Bakers. He, I let him win the discussion. So, um, But he, also you'll notice that in both of these pictures, it's women who are driving the cars. At this time, women did not drive cars. That was not, first of all, virtually no one could afford a car. This was, you know, all car purchases were uh, wealthy people. And uh, for women, so you, now you're, you're talking about this relatively small group of women that have an awful lot of money. Uh, and the issue with this and the reason that they were um, really orienting their marketing toward women uh, was the manual crank starter for gasoline cars. There had been a few self-starters that had been invented, but none of them really worked very well. And so those were just sort of fits and starts, and so everybody was back using the manual crank starter, which um, you know could be difficult to use and uh, also dangerous. If the engine uh, kicked back, you could get that thing spinning back. It killed people, uh, injured a lot of people. Um, and so with the electric cars, you just had to hit a switch, you turn the thing on, and, and you're off to the races. And so that was really the big competitive advantage that they had at the time. Um, I, I think it's interesting, you know, looking at the dimensions of, of this car, you know, it's so tall, and that's, that is what it looked like. That's not stretched out or anything. And then you'll note, in, this is the front, and you just have this little tiny front end here that would have been an engine compartment. Uh, except that it, they didn't have an, an engine up there. They had a little electric motor down here. Uh, so pretty much any space in this car uh, that is not part of the cab is filled with batteries. Uh, and that was the, the real cost difference with these things was the batteries. They're very expensive. Um, and they were lead acid batteries, just like you probably have in your car today. The technology for most batteries is really identical. Um, there, fortunately for electric cars, there's been a bit of an improvement, although for a hundred years, not nearly as much as what I think we should have expected. Um, but, um, it, you know, so at, with this, you can see really it looks like a carriage, you know, sort of like it's an opera coach, like a Cinderella kind of a carriage. Uh, just minus the horses. Um, the tires are uh, solid rubber. Uh, they were Mott's cushion tires, they were called. And these cars were really heavy, and the tires of the day um, blew out easily. So they would go to these things. And the main cost of upkeep with an electric was the tires. Um, Henry Ford had a... Uh, Henry Ford... Um, bought Detroit Electrics for uh, Clara as well as for Edsel. Clara drove them for a long time. And um, he, I, at the uh, Benson Ford Research Center in Detroit, they have um, a copy of a letter that was sent from Detroit Electric to uh, Henry Ford that showed it was really a, it was a promotion to get him to come to the Detroit Auto Show, uh, which I think he probably would have gone to anyway. But I'm sure they sent these out to everyone, and it showed the costs. It was a, he had a um, I want to say it was an 08 uh, that Clara was driving at the time, and it showed all of the service costs, and it was you know a dollar here and 75 cents there and. Uh, you know, everything until you got down to tires totaled up to about five bucks, and then there was $179 in tires over a couple of years. So that was quite a bit of money at the time. Uh, you know, the average person was making about $1,000 a year. Excuse me, the average man was making about $1,000 a year 
at the time. So uh, you know, this was a pretty expensive uh, prospect. And uh, the cars uh, were quite expensive. Um, in uh, 1911, they came out with a roadster that they were trying to compete with the uh, regular, the gas car companies that they got down to $2,000. Uh, but most of their cars range from about $2,500 to $3,500. And then uh, when the Edison battery came out that doubled the mileage, uh, that was an additional $600 charge if somebody wanted to upgrade those batteries. So um, you know, at, at that time, you could get a gas car that would be comparable for probably 60%, 65% of the cost. Uh, so they knew that they were dealing with, an, uh, with very much a high-end trade, and they needed to uh, duplicate as much as possible the kind of trappings that uh, women and uh, urban doctors, who were really their other primary group uh, for cars, uh, would, would be used to. And so they did this kind of interior, uh, really beautiful work. The, and the um, exteriors, or many coats of lacquer, beautiful, beautiful um, finish work, all brass fittings and headlamps and so on. And then um, they did leather interiors like this, uh, as well as a European broadcloth um, with a, a few choices, and they would customize things as well. Um, You'll, you'll see here, so th this is the back seat, and that's where you drive it. Uh, the front seat, um, in, in this case, uh, they do have two opposing seats. In most of their cars, they would have a bench seat in back like this, and then they would have um, over on this side, they would have sort of a diagonal seat uh, in the front, and then a jump seat. Uh, that you could pull back to, to sit on if you had a, a fourth person in the car. Uh, so um, you know, so you're you're sitting here driving, and there's no gas pedal. Um, there, you know, you don't you don't have a steering wheel. A uh, little bit odd, right? Um, well, this is the equivalent of the gas pedal. You had just a little shifter that would take it um, from first speed up to, with most of their vehicles, up to fifth speed. And they were fixed speeds. So if you were in first, you were going four miles an hour. And if you went up to second, you'd be going eight and so on. And t top speed typically just above or below uh, 25 miles an hour, which was fast, especially given that the roads at the time were horrible, very few that were paved. Uh, unless you were really in, right in the city. Um, so that was how you got it to move. And then this thing is a steering tiller. And that's how you would be able to steer the thing. You'd just pull that thing back and forth. So uh, when you were parked, you would just flip that up against the side. Um, nice little bud vase there as well. Uh, and uh, they would have little like toilet cases kind of things that you could keep your makeup in or whatever and watches that would be on it. Uh, so so when you pull, did it go backwards? Um, that was on, on the shifter, yeah. So if you, went far, if you went farther back with the shifter, yeah, then that would take you back. Yep. Did they have a brake? They did have brakes, yeah. So there was a brake on the floor. The, uh, That's yeah, the, the average um, distance between charges at this time and up through 1910 was about 50 miles. When Edison came out with his nickel steel battery, which was fine, he, he had been promising it for years. This is what all the electric car companies were holding out hope for as they saw the gas cars really taken off and them leveling off was that Edison was going to come out with this battery, and he had promised it for years and years. And finally, uh, in 1910, he got it perfected, and it was in 1911 models of just a couple of manufacturers, and that doubled the mileage. Yeah. So that would go up to 100 miles average. And um, with Detroit Electric, 
uh, they did a mileage test in September 1910 with a uh, Edison battery. Does anybody remember what the mileage was? It was in the first book. 211. 211? Okay, so 211 miles. I was thinking it was 250 something. Um, I think they were trying to beat 211. I forget. It's been a while since I read that book. But um, they, uh, they got an awful lot of, uh, they got a lot of mileage with the Edison. It was a really good battery. Uh, but it was also extremely expensive. And Detroit Electric ended up getting an exclusive on it uh, from 1912 forward. And that's really where Baker really declined. And Detroit Electric was able to continue to grow their business really up until about World War I. And then everybody's business you know, went down the drain. Did it have to be chartered in a special place? Or? Thank you for asking that question. This is the Detroit Electric Garage that was on Woodward downtown. Um, you can see a little showroom here and the rest of the place um, on the inside look like that. So these are uh, all these cars in charging bays. Uh, they would have typically, um, I said there was an article that I read uh, from 1910 that they, they went through this place. It was really fascinating if you're into you know, weird car stuff. Um, but they had uh, on average about 150 cars there a night. And um, so they would, the way that, that they worked it, um, really if you think about it, at, at this time, unless you had your own livery staff, so thinking about your carriages, right? So, if you had your own livery staff and you had a, a lot of room so that you could keep your horses and everything, you might have that um, at your house. But most people in the city didn't have the space or the money to have the staff. And so they would use a livery stable just like you'd think of from the old westerns. Uh, and so when they wanted their carriage, they would um, call down to the stable uh, in the meantime, the stable had already gone through, cleaned up their coach, the fed the horses, you know, done all that stuff. And so they would have what they called a chaser who would get in the carriage, drive that over to your place and leave that for you. And when you were done, you'd call them back and the chaser would come out, take a streetcar typically uh, to your place, pick the thing up, bring it back, take care of the horses, clean the thing up and all of that. So that was the... Um, the, the current uh, system. That was the way everybody did it. And you know, one, one of the things I've really noticed in, in looking at the history of all this stuff is how change always seems to be evolutionary. Almost never do we see a total revolution. You know, car design really came from what was there before. And the care and feeding of these cars also came from what happened before. So people um, would call up, uh, need my car. The guy would, he'd, in totally white uh, uniform, white gloves, would drive the car to the residence. They'd lock it up in front. Uh, the owner had their own keys. And then they'd catch a, a street car and go back. You'd do whatever you wanted to do with your car call them back, they'd come pick it up, they would um, clean it, get everything all set, put it into a charging bay uh, where it would charge overnight or for whatever length of time you left it there. Before they brought it out, also they would put fresh cut flowers in your bud vase. So if, it's um, pretty cool. How would you know if your battery was getting low or if it stopped something? Yeah, they had meters. Um, and so you, you generally had a pretty good idea. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And you know, it was the same problem as today, right? Um, you know, some people did have charging stations at home. Henry Ford put one in. Um, and, and a lot of people who really had money and were into the mechanics side of things, which was a, a very small group of people, uh, they would set their own charging station up and do all their own work or have somebody working for them that did it. Um, and, you know, so in that case, they would have, they'd be able to do all this themselves. But um, most often, uh, people would just use the garage 
the way that they would have used this stable, which I just think is really fascinating. Um, okay, so um, anything else? Any questions on Detroit Electric? Any things? Okay, so um, Detroit's first mob war. So with the Detroit Electric scheme, the major subplot, really, if you if you kind of go past the mystery that happens, what you see is the rise and fall of the electric car industry. You see the, you know, really as it's kind of hitting its <clears throat> zenith with uh, these Edison batteries and the mileage that they're getting with that. And then by the end of the book, uh, Charles Kettering has uh, come out with a self-starter uh, for gasoline cars that works. And they see, we just might be in trouble here. Uh, with the second book, uh, in looking at Detroit history, the next thing that I thought was most interesting was this mob war. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about the players and, and what happened in that. So this guy, Vito Adamo, very dapper looking character, isn't he? Um, you know, it's funny how much these characters evolve from the pictures, from what I see of them and, you know, my imagination of what they would have been like, because there is zero in the historical record that talks about Vito Adamo's personality or anything like that. He wasn't on Facebook. Um, so he came over from Sicily uh, sometime in uh, early in the, the first decade of the 20th century, and uh, he was a grocer. Uh, he lived in Ford City, uh, which is now part of Wyandotte, so downriver. Uh, yes, Wyandotte fan over here? Okay. Um, yeah, so, so part of it was previously Ford City, named after not Henry Ford, but a guy who um, uh, owned a big alkali um, factory, whatever, down there. Anyway, um, so he, he was there. He had this grocery. Um, he was uh, apparently uh, good at being a criminal, and uh, he got his gang together, and um, they did black handwork, so uh, basically the protection racket. So they would go typically to another Sicilian immigrant who had a business, tell them, um, you know, there are some elements in this neighborhood that are a little unsavory, like us, and uh, if you don't pay up every week, then something bad's probably going to happen to your place. And if they didn't pay up, then bad things would happen until they started paying. Uh, and that, that was really sort of the typical racket for uh, the Sicilian criminals at the time. Uh, he branched out. He got into a lot of other things. And he, once he really had control of the Wyandotte area crime, he expanded to Detroit and uh, was um, very big in importation, brought in lots of illegal immigrants. Uh, so there was a network going uh, from Sicily to Canada and then down into Windsor and across the river. And he was involved in all of that. Also, uh, importation of uh, liquor, uh, untaxed liquor that they would bring in. He had his own brewery, um, brought in narcotics, although uh, narcotics were available at any pharmacy so long as you looked reasonably respectable, you could go in and buy your heroin and morphine and cocaine and whatever else you wanted. Uh, if you looked like an addict, they weren't supposed to sell it to you. Uh, so you needed to clean yourself up good before you went in. Uh, but there were lots and lots of drug addicts. I'm heading off on another direction here, but um, there was actually a higher percentage of Americans addicted to drugs in 1910 than there are now. And they were mostly women, and they tended to be middle-aged or older. Uh, they would take patent medicines for uh, stomach problems or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and up until 1905, they didn't have to list the ingredients, uh, and many didn't afterwards. And so, um, you know, they'd take this medicine and start feeling better. Start feeling pretty good. 
And they'd take a little more and, you know, after a couple of weeks, they were feeling good enough and they'd stop and wow, did they did not feel good. So they just would keep taking this stuff and they'd, you know, maybe, maybe or maybe not find out that it contained morphine, uh, opium, you know, some, some addictive drug. That was a, and yes, and virtually everything had alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. They were, they were definitely able to make you feel better. Uh, at least for a while. Um, so that, that was drug addiction. I, th that's the kind of stuff that I find so fascinating about this as I go through the research and looking at the parallels between what life was like a hundred years ago and what life is like now. It, you know, it was the same. We were the same people. We have more stuff and we've had people who've invented all this technology that probably none of us even understand. Um, you know, really, there's a magic box here that has these pictures on it um, because I certainly couldn't, you know, come up with a, a design for something like this. So they were just as smart as we were and they had all the same issues and, you know, it was just a, a matter of the, during this period of time, you know, what's happened in terms of technology primarily over the last hundred years. And the parallels are amazing. I mean, really, the, the, when you look at society and culture, uh, they dealt with all the same stuff. You look at electric cars, they dealt with all the same stuff. Anyway, back to mob war. So, um, so Adamo was the kingpin. Now, I, I should say that this is not godfather kind of mafia. Uh, that money came with prohibition. Uh, that's really what created organized crime in the United States because there was so much money in liquor that these uh, criminals became incredibly wealthy and then were able to create these big networks and, and really become a power. Even Adamo and in 1910 when he was running the rackets in Detroit um, was still just a notch above being the leader of a street gang. Uh, but they were able to do, he, he was really able to get things pretty well consolidated in crime. He's the first one that really got him going in organized crime in Detroit and started a very colorful history um, that continues today. Uh, so um, next door to him uh, were the Gianola brothers, or actually across the street. They owned a grocery store too in Ford City. Uh, and uh, Tony was the brains of the outfit. Um, he, uh, he, they also came over from Sicily um, right around the same time that Adamo did. Um, and they got in competition. They saw that Adamo was making a great deal of money. I'm sure they were already involved in crime one way or another, but I find it really interesting that these guys own grocery stores across the street from each other uh, down by Wyandotte um, and they were the, the guys to control Detroit crime for a long time. So uh, the Gianola brothers uh, went into the beer business. They, got, uh, they uh, built a brewery or stole one, I'm not sure, but they got in the beer business and they undercut Adamo's prices and uh, so Adamo, you know, was seeing all this loss of revenue uh, and uh, so he found out what was going on. He matched the prices and threw in ice because uh, there's, you know, you don't have refrigeration. You got to keep that stuff cold. There's a big expense in ice. Uh, and Tony Gianola was not happy about that. And so uh, that really started this escalation. Uh, first of they were beating people up and uh, then it, it kind of went on from there. So uh, the oldest uh, brother in uh, this family, um, Gaetano, uh, I actually left out of Motor City Shakedown. Um, he was the consigliere um, of the, the gang um, and wasn't really that involved from what I could discover in um, any direct involvement in the crime that they did. And so I, I left him out just because you can only have so many characters and have people keep track of what's going on. But I did include 
the uh, lovely and talented Sam Gianola, uh, who was um, pretty much what he looks like, I think. Um, he was the enforcer of the gang, um, definitely not a nice guy. And they did things like, when they first came to attention of the police in 1911, when uh, one of their people uh, was found uh, naked uh, in a field with body parts cut off and uh, had been lit on fire. And uh, he worked for the Gianolas. A few weeks before that, they had had a police raid and um, they had about $2,000 worth of illegal olive oil. Not sure what made it illegal. I guess it was import duties. I guess it must be. Uh, confiscated by the police and I mean that's a lot of money. I mean today you wouldn't want to lose two grand but a hundred years ago that's an awful lot of dough. So um, somebody tipped off the cops that they had all of this olive oil and uh, they thought it was this guy named Sam Buendo and uh, so they took care of him and that's when the police started to notice the the Gianola brothers. And Sam in one of his typical poses uh, for the police, uh, probably was the person who did that. Um, this is an um, article uh, from November 1913 in the Free Press. All year long, um, there virtually every day in the Free Press, the News and the Herald, the three big papers for Detroit at the time, uh, front page headlines about this mob war. It was just, it was, the, at, newspapers at that time were sort of a combination between a newspaper and a tabloid. Uh, there was a lot of sensationalist stuff and so they ate this up and of course we eat that up, right? That's, you know, what we read all the time. That's the exciting stuff. Uh, so there was this shotgun feud and where they have the uh, X's with the circles, those are all places that someone was killed. Um, you'll note here that I have whited that out. Um, there were a couple of people killed there uh, that I didn't want to spoil. If you're going to read Motor City Shakedown, uh, you'll find out who wins. Uh, but they went, went through this, um, this shotgun feud. I mean, people just being shotgunned in the streets of the city in broad daylight. Uh, and um, eventually in, in November 1913, although I've compressed it back to 1912 in my book, um, two of the uh, brothers were killed and uh, the other gang wa were the victors in this mob war and continued on um, up until 1919 when they were assassinated. Uh, and the person who assassinated them was shortly thereafter assassinated, and so things went. Uh, so that was what was going on there, but really why I have this picture is that I want to know what's up with the Chinese, <laughs> because it's been almost a hundred years since they discovered the Fountain of Youth, and they haven't shared it with us yet. So I don't know if that's why there are so many people in China. Uh, somebody's got to investigate this. Uh, so, um, the Bernstein boys, this is not actually a picture of the Bernstein boys, um, but uh, if you've read Motor City Shakedown, you probably could see the Bernstein boys in this picture. Uh, the, eventually, uh, Abe Bernstein and his brothers were the leaders of the Purple Gang, and during Prohibition, they rose to absolutely control Detroit crime. Uh, the Purple Gang is probably somewhat exaggerated, but is thought to have been responsible for as many as 500 murders. Um, they were thought to be the uh, button men, as they say, uh, in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in Chicago uh, that Capone brought in out-of-town hitters, and they think that it was Purple Gang people who did that. Um, but back at this time, they were kids and uh, they had a street gang and they dealt with the Sicilian criminals. They did errands for them and that sort of thing. 
uh, and they, you know, robbed people and, you know, did the kind of stuff you'd expect out of a street gang at the time. And, um, you know, they were, I, I think it's really interesting to, you know, for me again, it's, you know, a lot of this is just sort of my impression of who these guys were and then trying to create characters for them. Um, Abe uh, was the boss, um, also in a typical uh, pose uh, for the police. Uh, he was the oldest, uh, very charismatic leader, uh, and he ran that gang for a long time. At this time, he was about 17 years old and the, the leader of this kid's street gang. His uh, brother, Joey, uh, who uh, eventually retired to California, uh, was able to, he didn't spend a lot of time in prison, I think he was maybe 10 years, uh, and then uh, supposedly went straight uh, and, uh, and lived in California. Um, there's some dispute as to whether Joey or Ray were the craziest uh, and really the, the most psychotic killer uh, of the bunch. Um, from these pictures, you'd think it was Ray. Uh, that's a face you would not want to have looking at you in a dark alley, right? I mean, that's a scary looking dude. Uh, in the Detroit Electric Scheme, um, Ray Bernstein ended up with sort of a um, retrospective appearance. Uh, when I was first writing the book, I had no intent on uh, the second book involving anybody from the Purple Gang. And as I started writing the second and I got into the Adamos and the Giannolas, I just, I get on these uh, bents where I'm thinking about the, uh, in this case, uh, about the mob and what the mob in Detroit really ended up being. And um, of course, everybody knows the Purple Gang. That's what Detroit is known for in crime uh, other than Jimmy Hoffa. And uh, so as I looked through it, I went, you know, I could, I could fit Ray Bernstein in here somewhere without even having a name. And uh, he's the, the boy who takes the blackmail money from Will in the Detroit Electric Scheme, even though there's no name. I actually, um, shortly before it was published, I went in and changed his description and you know, made, it, made it work so that he could be a Bernstein. Or a new relation to Sam? Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, my understanding is that it's a, you know, a couple of spots removed, but Sam, you know, I don't have this on good authority, but I've been told that Sam is a relative of these guys. Well, I understand why you didn't want to use his name, though. <laughs> Somebody would call Sam. That's right. <laughs> you know, one, one very good thing is that dead people can't sue you for libel. So that, that's the only reason I could write about the Dodge Brothers the way I did in the first book, um, or a lot of things that happened uh, in the second book. Uh, so um, we got Ray, Joey, Abe, and then we've got cute little Izzy, uh, who is a newsboy in um, Motor City Shakedown. And he's the one that uh, Will uh, first sees and thinks that he must be the kid that took the blackmail money from him a couple of years earlier, but then realizes that this kid is too young. The other kid would have aged and... Uh, so it can't be him, and he ends up having Izzy lead him to Ray eventually, and then he gets hooked up with these uh, future Purple Gang guys, and um, they help him out uh, in uh, his quest uh, while also creating some havoc that he hadn't expected. Um, but I, I loved Izzy writing him. Uh, I have he he was the least crime oriented of the brothers. He hung around with this for a while and then he moved out to California. And I don't think he ever spent any significant time at all in jail. Uh, so he's the, uh, the, the tough, uh, wisecracking kid uh, in Motor City Shakedown. Uh, best picture ever, The Purple Gang. Uh, 
This is how they wanted their pictures taken. Now, one of the few pictures that's not uh, in a lineup or um, <laughs> that sort of thing. So um, with, with that mob war, um, it really set the tone for how people perceive crime in Detroit going forward. And uh, it, really, um, it really changed the impression that the people there had of Sicilians. And uh, it really changed the face of, of crime. And it started this, this run toward the godfather you know, type characters. So the, with the Bernsteins, you had the Jewish mafia running things um, for the better part of a decade. And then the Sicilians were in again and, and moving forward. And uh, as I understand it, are, are still very active in the crime world over that way. Uh, one sort of interesting aside, the first presentation I did for this book uh, was at Greenfield Village. And so I went through the presentation about the Damos and the Giannolas and the war and all of this. And um, a man and a woman came up to me afterwards and uh, the man said that uh, Tony Giannola was his great-grandfather and the woman's great-grandfather. He was the first son of the first son and had uh, Tony's ring, gold ring with a giant diamond in it. And uh, they told me about the stories that um, grandma had of when she was a kid, uh, when they thought they were being attacked, mom would lower them down into a dumpster out the window uh, so that if somebody came in shooting, the kids wouldn't be there, you know, that sort of thing. So it's, it's really very fascinating hearing a, a personal account of um, these, these people in the book. Um, the, the one last thing I want to say, and then I'll, I'll take any questions that you've got, is some of the weirdest thing that I, that I come across in, in research are the things that I think are the most interesting. I was reading through all the accounts of this mob war that I could find in the papers, and um, there was a, an article that um, went through uh, Vito Adamo when the police finally went through his house. They found a book, uh, that just kind of loose leaf book that had been put together uh, that was written in Italian, they couldn't read it, but it had pictures of uh, guys being stabbed in the back with stilettos and things like that, just kind of crude drawings. And they thought, okay, here's our evidence. Finally, we've got this you know, firsthand account of what happened in this mob war. And when they had it translated, they found out that uh, Vito Adamo was actually writing a dime novel and, uh, you know, he was trying his hand at being an author. Uh, so, you know, little, little weird things like that that really make these people human, you know. And, and that's really what I enjoy about it is uh, discovering the people who were behind both the good things and the bad things. I'll stay off the soapbox on Edsel Ford, but he was a good guy. Uh, questions? I've got two questions. Hmm? Any of the uh, structures of the Detroit Electric uh, buildings <coughs> remain, or are they all gone? They don't. They're all gone. Uh, I, I went over and, and looked. Fortunately, you can find online some of the old maps mm -hmm. of the time. Uh, and so I went down there and I looked, and there is a very old factory that's located on the site, but um, the, uh, the way that it's set up is wrong. So it's it is different. It doesn't look like any of the buildings survived. That's not surprising looking at uh, Detroit as a big picture. Yeah. Question number two, where did, where did the Fleischer brothers come into the Purple Gang? They, uh, Harry was a childhood friend of the Bernsteins, uh, and uh, so I assume, you know, brother would have been the same. Uh, so they started out in this street gang uh, and, you know, worked their way up in society. I met one of those fellows one night. Really? Uh, after he'd gotten out of prison. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You were in prison. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's Almate. <Alabama. laughs> yes. How did uh, Detroit Electric uh, last until 1939? Great question. So the question is, how did Detroit Electric last until 1939? Um, they 
really peaked just before World War I. And then at that time, they were selling about 2,500 cars and um, I think about 1,500 trucks a year at that time. So, you know, you think about that great big factory, it doesn't seem like a whole lot of business. Um, but when you're paying people virtually nothing, you know, you could, you could do pretty well. Uh, and it, during World War I, the sales dropped then, and they were, for a few years during the war, they were under 1,000 cars. And then after the war, they went back up and got up near the 2,000 range. And it just kind of, it slowly dropped. Uh, and I think they were, were making about 1,000 cars a year in 1929. And the um, uh, depression wiped them out. And they uh, sold the company out of bankruptcy. And the people that bought the company did it primarily for the service business. They still manufactured cars, uh, but as time went on, they made fewer and fewer. And, and by the mid-30s, they were just making cars out of parts that they had, or they would get an old car that had problems, and they'd bring it in, and they'd fix it up, and then they'd sell that. So for all intents and purposes, as a real car manufacturer, they went under in 1929, but they hung on building some cars, and it was a handful a year at that point uh, through the 30s. Thank you. You're welcome. What Dean. Is your next project? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, next writing project, uh, the third is going to be the third book in the series. Uh, it's called Detroit Breakdown, and uh, any anybody know where uh, Detroit Breakdown? And Motor City Shakedown come from? Good. You probably told it on, on the radio Friday, right? Uh, I think I did. I think I did. <laughs> um, it, this is a you know good good uh, rock and roll trivia question. Uh, the Jay Giles band uh, had a song called Detroit Breakdown, and uh, the the chorus is Detroit Breakdown, Motor City Shakedown. So complicated chorus, but. I, uh, I actually was trying to figure out what I was going to call Motor City Shakedown, and um, I was driving home from work or something, and uh, I still picture where I was when you know this song was playing on you know probably WRKR I, I guess, and um, all of a sudden it just I was thinking about you know what am I going to call this? I just had no idea what I was going to call the book, and I'm hearing this song and I just went, that's it. Motor City Shakedown, it's got to be, you know, Will gets his, you know, his father's getting shook down by the Giannolas, and that's, you know, part of what really propels the story. So um, it just so happened that as I was looking for what I wanted to base the third book on, uh, that I came across Eloise Hospital, which was um, the Wayne County Insane Asylum. So all the rest of the <coughs> asylums in the state were state-owned. This was the only one that was owned by a county. And um, at this time, so this is 1912, they had um, about 1,000 inmates and patients. So the, the inmates actually were the tubercular patients, and the patients were the, the mental patients. They also had the county house there, which was the poor house. These, so these were all housed in this same complex. Uh, during the Depression, they had as many as 10,000 people living at Eloise Hospital at a time. Uh, it was set on uh, just over 900 acres and w had 78 buildings at one point. So this thing was just absolutely massive, you know, city that? unto itself. Uh, it's in uh, Westland um, on Michigan Avenue, uh, really like... I don't know, maybe six or eight miles from uh, the airport. Okay. And yeah, if you get off at the exit you take for the airport and go the other way, you run into Michigan, you take a right, and the buildings that still remain, uh, you see the, the K Beard building, uh, which is what currently houses the Wayne County Council on Aging and a couple of other things, is still there, and they use that in a very limited fashion. Uh, there are four buildings still there. All of them date after 1912, most of them built in the 20s and 30s. 
Uh, so fortunately, there was a book published in 1913 that was a history of Eloise Hospital that also contained um, detail on all the buildings. Uh, so I was able to get you know, very, very good information about how the place was laid out, what buildings were actually there, because they renamed buildings, you know, building that they'd call Building A, then turned into Building F, and they, you know, had all of these names that they changed as they continued to add more and more buildings onto the place. So anyway, so that's Eloise Hospital. Um, and, Eloise. pardon? Who is Eloise? Good question. Who's Eloise? Why'd they call it that? Um, the, uh, the postmaster of Detroit in the uh, late 1800s had a daughter named Eloise, and when they opened the uh, Nankin Township Post Office, uh, named after Nanking, China, um, the, they decided that they would name the post office Eloise, really sort of as a joke um, because of the postmaster's daughter, uh, and then it just sort of stuck. And they started calling the hospital. They actually ended up with the post office at the hospital. And so that was Eloise, and the whole place just became Eloise. Was she was not a patient, no. Although um, the guy that the phrase, the real McCoy, uh, comes from was a patient. He invented some part for trains. I can't remember exactly what it was. Uh, and there were a lot of... Um, uh, counterfeits of this piece that didn't work very well, so you wanted to make sure you bought the real McCoy. Uh, so, yes? Um, what is the fascination with this era that you're seeing then in the other? Yeah, and let me just say a little bit more about the book before I, before I answer that. Um, so with, with this book, um, it's really, what, what my editor wanted was um, to take, really to sort of step out of this cycle that had been created in the first two books, with Will dealing with these issues that predate the first book. And um, she, what she wanted to see was really more of a episodic kind of a mystery. Uh, so um, as, I, as I was trying to figure out what I wanted to write, and I came across Eloise, then I thought, well, I've got to have some kind of relative in Eloise Hospital with a problem, so that Will goes in there and then discovers that it's difficult to get out. And, uh, <laughs> and of course, you know, at, at that time, you know, we would think about what they did in mental health as being pretty barbaric. Uh, so it's exactly what I want for Will. Uh, you know, gotta, gotta get him beaten and abused a bit more, uh, as if he could take it. Um, and so that's, you know, that's really where, where that book uh, goes. And uh, it is for the first time something that I've written uh, partly in the voice of a woman. Uh, there's alternating narration between Will and Elizabeth. And I learned a great deal about the way women think uh, when my wife Shelley and uh, my daughters and Shelley's sister and some people in the writing group that I belong to told me how idiotic it was uh, to write some of the things that I had written because uh, I just don't think that way. So <laughs> fortunately, most of my early uh, readers are women, and so it really, really helped. But it, you know, it was really interesting because you know, Will's voice sort of came naturally. You know, it, it's sort of just the way that it seemed like I ought to write the books. And uh, going to Elizabeth's voice, which is has to be very significantly different, right? I mean, you can't have two people who sound the same. And so trying to figure out how to make that voice different enough and to be distinct and still be Elizabeth, you know, who really speaks very similarly to way, the way that Will does, although she's not as profane. Um, but, you know, same kind of vocabulary and that sort of thing. Uh, and try to figure out ways to, to make her distinct. And it was, it was really interesting. It was a, a really good exercise for me as a writer. Okay, so why this, why this time period uh, is a question. I have, for some reason, I've always been fascinated with the early 20th century. Um, when I go back like to Civil War era, the people seem different 
to me for some reason. You know, they, I, I have a hard time putting myself in their head. Uh, but for some reason, once I get to the turn of the century, and I, and I think part of it is, um, you know, as the Industrial Revolution is going nuts, there's all these new technologies and, you know, I kept coming across all these parallels between the way that people think now and thought then and the problems that they have now and problems they had then. Um, and so it was the first era in history that I really felt like I could put myself in the head of a character. So that was part of it. But um, the United States at the time was becoming what it is today. You know, we really, we realized that we had this power. We were a world power and uh, we started throwing our muscle around um, in the, the first decade of the century. We invaded Central America like 14 times. I don't remember the details, but I mean, we just sort of went nuts and, um, you know, all of our uh, Monroe Doctrine and the Roosevelt Corollary and, and uh, anyway, just, you know, we, we decided that we were the tough guys and we were going to make sure everybody knew that, um, which I think we maybe do a little too much these days. Uh, so that, you know, we, we were becoming the country that we are now. People were starting to think about things like social reform. There was huge political discord. The, these immigrants that were coming in uh, by the millions um, were, many of them were socialists, many of them were anarchists. And when they got here and found out that at best they could get a job that would let them live till tomorrow, um, there was a, all this uh, political activism going on, and it was a just supercharged time. Uh, huge um, uh, problems between the haves and have-nots. Um, I just I, I find it a really fascinating era for a whole bunch of different reasons, and for some reason much more so than getting up into the 20s and and 30s. So, I you know I don't know where my writing is going to take me, but um, I think most of it is going to end up being right in this this time period. Yeah, you know, some some of it I I think really sort of unconsciously was a marketing <laughs> thing. You know, just kind of thinking about what what are people going to be interested in because you got to think about that when you're writing a book. You know, if they're not interested in it, they're not. You know, you're not going to sell the book in the first place. So you know you remain an unpublished author. I didn't want to do that. Uh, so I, I um, you know, in, in looking at those parallels, and I guess, you know, for me, it's the things that I find really interesting, I think other people would too. And so that's, when I came across enough of those, I thought, yeah, this is it. This is what I need to write. Yes. Where and how do you do your research? Um, where and how do I do my research? Uh, Initially, I, I spent three months just doing research. So this was in 08. Uh, in early 08, I, at really the beginning of the year, I took three months, um, spent a lot of time in Detroit, went to the Benson Ford Research Center at the Henry Ford Museum, which is a fabulous place. And they don't even make you have credentials to go in and look at all the cool stuff they have there, you know. So I was holding letters from Thomas Edison, you know, in my hands and stuff like that, which to me is amazing. Um, and uh, I called them, I, you know, I figured at any minute they were going to say, so, you know, what university are you affiliated with or, or something? Uh, and they never did. And I told them what I was looking for and made an appointment. And they had three carts like this loaded up with materials when I got there. Uh, and so I, I spent a number of days there. Uh, went to the Detroit Historical Museum, spent some time there. Excuse me, the um, National Automotive History Collection at the Detroit Public Library. And a ton of time at the Detroit Public Library going through the newspaper archives. Um, that was really the, the mine for most of the information that I came across having to do w with the, the people stuff, the culture stuff, um, everything, you know, down to pricing, you know, what did it cost to buy a, a you know, dinner then or, you know, a, a hotel room or 
uh, a suit, you know, and any of that kind of stuff. So I could get a, a better idea of really what everyday life was. And even down to things like the weather. In the Detroit Electric Scheme, um, the last night in the book is society night at um, the Detroit Auto Show, the 1911 Auto Show. And, uh, and it was a big deal. It was really cool. I mean, really a neat show. But um, it had unexpectedly warmed up that day and um, a, just a pea soup fog enveloped the city. And I wanted to get to the auto show. You know, it's just one of those history things that I think is, is interesting. Um, and I wanted to do society night because that was really a big deal then. It cost a buck to get in where it was normally 50 cents. Um, and uh, they had an orchestra playing and hors d'oeuvres and champagne and you know all the rich folk uh, would go there to be seen. Um, but as I was reading through the, the newspaper articles, they talked about this fog and you know going to the place and there were more cars in one place than anyone had ever seen just on the outside because there was all these car people who had come to society night. Uh, and, you know, looking at the, that weather and I just went, you know, it seemed almost cliche to some extent, you know, to, to put this fog in that these guys had to work their way through. But I went, hey, it's the way it was. It was real. <laughs> um, so uh, that was my initial research. Uh, I've gone back a few times since, uh, but I got so much information there and I've bought all kinds of books on the history of Detroit and uh, cultural history of the era, a lot of stuff just on the era in general. Um, and of course the internet is really a fabulous source um, for, for lots of surprisingly good information. So these days most of my research I do online. I had to figure out how long it took in 1912 to get from Detroit to Kalamazoo on a train. Think, you know, where am I going to find that? Well, I had managed to find a book online in, in uh, Google Books that is a like a 1650 page um, train schedule book from the whole country. Uh, you know, so dig through there. Okay, here's you know here's Detroit. You know, take now it was the Michigan Central, which they still called it, but they were bought by the New York Central, so figuring that out, and okay, it went here to here, and you know, was able to come across it. So uh, I love the internet. I, you know, I can't, I can't imagine writing these things pre-internet. You'd have to write the whole thing at a library. I mean, I, I can't imagine how long it would take. Yes, sir? So, so in your writing, um, is your plot driven more by historical events or more by your, your fictional license? Um, it, it depends. Uh, the, the one thing that I always try to keep in mind is that the story always wins. If there is a uh, historical fact that I think is interesting and I want to get into the book, if it doesn't advance the story somehow, then it doesn't go in. Um, ultimately, fiction is about the story, right? You know, it, with um, historical fiction, whether it's mystery or um, literature of some other type, uh, you want to be able to learn something as you're reading it. That's, to me, the fascination is that, you know, as I'm, I love history, so if I'm reading a historical novel, I'm picking up history at the same time I'm being entertained. Um, and so the, the story really has got to be um, the, the driving force always. But with things like um, this gang war, the, the gang war really um, occurred in a very similar way to the way that I write it. And so um, the fun for me then is figuring out how do I get Will into this thing in a way that seems believable and um, be able to get him out at the end. And as a first person narrator, he's got to be there for all this stuff. You know, I can't, it can't be somebody saying, you know, by the way, did you hear that the Giannolas and the Adamos, you know, he's, he's got to live it. 
so uh, I think it's great fun to try to work out my plot so that I can weave it through these historical occurrences. Uh, so, you know, it's a little of both. With, with the Detroit Electric scheme, I knew the end, I knew the beginning, I knew nothing else. That was really where I started from. Um, and the beginning changed uh, later on. And, um, you know, the stories always evolve. I, I outline and uh, I then update the outline. And eventually, when I've gotten far enough, I just stop looking at the outline because it's nothing like what the, the book is ending up. Um, and uh, so, you know, it just it sort of takes on its own life. But ultimately, it's got to be the story. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the, the question is, if I put facts into my novels, are they facts or are they fiction? Are they um, true? And are, true? Yeah, so, so is it true? Um, yes. Uh, I, there are a few things. In Motor City Shakedown, for example, I changed the way that the, um, the death of the brothers who died. The, way, the actual occurrence of that, those deaths is different than the way that I describe it in the book. Um, but in my author's notes, I say what really happened. Uh, so I, whenever I um, take any liberty, uh, I do make a note of it in the book. But the, the things that virtually everything in the book is as it occurred, in both books, is as it occurred in real life. I hate it when I find out that somebody told me a fact that was a lie. Right. I hate it. Uh, so I believed it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes, I hate that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a reader first. You know, I mean, I've always loved to read, and um, so that's, you know, I, I hate it when a mystery writer cheats and doesn't give me the clues, or at the very, you know, 20 pages from the end. Uh, like a certain Swedish author um, uh, that, you know, get, finally t gives you any reason to suspect anyone. Um, you know, that, that things like that just drive me nuts. Um, and so, the, you know, a mystery writer has to be fair and give the reader the clues that they need uh, to solve the crime, but you also have to do the sleight of hand so, you know, I'm saying, look at this red rubber ball while I'm doing something over here. And uh, that's really the trick to writing a mystery is to include the clues that somebody would be able to solve the crime, but try to draw their attention away to something else so that what they're noticing is the something else, not that clue. And at the end of the book, the, the ultimate uh, experience for me would be for a reader to get to the climax and go, what? Oh, <laughs> you know, that now it all, yes, it all makes sense. Why didn't I think of that? Yeah. You know, that's, that would be, that's the perfect uh, end for me. Have you made a decision as to how many decades forward you're going to carry this series? Well, it depends a great deal on how many, yeah, how many, <laughs> how many St. Martins or someone else would buy. Uh, I have a contract for four, so I've got um, two more for sure that'll come out, and um, I'm kind of toying with a nonfiction idea right now, um, and uh, I'll, I'm also thinking about maybe doing um, a little bit different series, but still set in a similar time period.